So sometimes I fall into a rabbit hole and uh, I've definitely done that this past week. <laughs> Pretty deep rabbit hole. So deep in fact that um, it might be a little hard to summarize what it's been about, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, so the rabbit hole, as you can see here, has been about harmony. And specifically, it's been about tonal harmony and um, trying to convey a sense of how that tonal harmony looks for me in my mind when I'm doing free improvisation. Um, the thing about tonal harmony in the common practice system that, you know, Bach and, and all the major classical composers used, and also all the major jazz musicians have used too. I mean, t t to a point anyway, um, certainly people like Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk and Art Tatum um, and, you know, Keith Jarrett are making great use of this system. The thing about the system is that it's super organized and it's very different from thinking of harmony as a sequence of unrelated chords that just happen to sound good together. So, um, what's going on here? Why are things organized the way they are? Uh, let's let's break it down. So the first thing I'm going to do is just think about a key center. Now we just have one chord. This is our key center. Let's say that we're in C major. What makes up our immediate harmonic landscape? The closest thing is what we call the diatonic chords of C major. And so if C is the is the one chord, then the two chord is D minor, three chord is E minor, four chord is F major, five is G or G7 if you're including the seventh, um, six is A minor, and the seven is B diminished or half diminished if you're including, including the seventh. Um, so that's our immediate harmonic world around C major. Oh, I should say, by the way, that these chords, the reason that, that they belong to the key of C major is simply that these are the chords that naturally fit in the scale of C major. And if we were to change this to minor, C minor, then uh, we'd be looking at the chords that naturally fit within the scale of C minor, which is a little more subtle. Uh, in this case, I'm using the scale of C harmonic minor, but if you're really including all the chords, you include the ones that fit within C harmonic minor, C ascending melodic minor, and C descending melodic minor. In any case, let's go back to C major. So um, here are our diatonic chords. And then the question is, how can we enrich this more? Well, we can add what are called secondary dominants or secondary chords, I should say, because here I'm not just using secondary dominants, I'm using secondary chords of different types. So secondary chords, what are secondary chords? They are special chords that don't belong to the key in terms of belonging to the scale of the home chord. They um, are kind of like signposts or arrows in this landscape that point at the diatonic chords of the key. So um, let's think about the ones that point at C major. Um, the mother of them all is B diminished. And that's because it has two tritones, B, F, and D, A flat, both of which resolve very strongly towards the um, chord tones of C major. B, F resolves to C, E, and D, A flat re resolves to E, G. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, this is the mother chord of these secondary chords, but um, what you can do is just choose any one of those two tritones and you get this whole sequence of other possible secondary chords. So G7 has the BF tritone and that's of course just the standard um, perfect cadence. Uh, but there are other secondary dominants, B flat seven, we call that the uh, backdoor cadence in jazz, D flat seven, which is what we call the tritone sub in jazz. And then a slightly more exotic one, E7. E7, I don't think has a name in jazz, uh, but you can think of it as the one that goes to the relative minor. 
Um, then we have the whole family of plagal cadences. So F minor six is of course the standard plagal cadence, but then we have the other plagal cadences that include those same tritones. A flat minor six, which incidentally is how you explain G7 altered because that's A flat minor six just over G. And then B6, which is pretty exotic, but still works. D minor six, which of course is just like G7. Okay, so all of these secondary chords go strongly towards C. But not only can we have these secondary chords going to C, and we can have all kinds of cool progressions just using these, but uh, we can have secondary chords going towards the diatonic chords of the key, okay? So I can go, I can, I can be in C, but then decide to go to the two, but instead of going straight to the two, I'll approach it via its um, secondary dominant A7. Or it's a backdoor cadence, C7. And then maybe I'll go back to C via its um, dominant G7. Okay, um, so that's just one of the myriad options. We're, we're, we already have a lot more options now. We have a whole constellation of choices. But again, they're all organized. They're all part of a hierarchy. Okay, now um, I just want you to notice that I've spent a lot of time, this is one of the things I, I, I've spent a lot of time coding um, this past week, on chord spellings. All right, so the chord spellings in C major are pretty obvious, but let's say that we're in F sharp major. Um, then, then the spellings are a little less obvious. You know, for example, um, I'm just going to take away the secondary dominance here, the secondary chords. Um, what's the three of F sharp major? Well, the three of F sharp major is a sharp minor and not B flat minor. And that's important because the letter B is already taken up with a four, which is B major. And uh, the seven of F sharp is E sharp half diminished, not F half diminished. Anyway, to me, it's important to get these things right in order to um, have the whole thing really convey the order and meaning that I want it to. Um, so the thing about tonal harmony is our map is, is, does, is not limited to this. Our map is actually quite a bit bigger because you can modulate, you can modulate to keys that are related to the home key. So in this case, um, here we go. These are the, the keys that Bach would have thought about as related to the home key. Um, later composers like Beethoven um, or even Mozart, or certainly Wagner would modulate to more distant keys, but these are the keys that Bach would modulate to typically. So, so what that means is if I go over here, we actually think about being in G major. And that means that I have access to the diatonic chords of G major. So for example, I have access to D7, which is not part of C major. Um, I also have access to B minor, the three of G major, which is very much not part of C major. So one thing I could do if I want to, if I want to modulate to G major is I could um, maybe start in C, you know, maybe I'd play around a little bit with the diatonic chords of C, go to the two, to the four, and then back to the one. And then maybe I'll go to a chord that belongs to both C major and G major, go to A minor, and, and then I'll go to a chord that only belongs to G major, to like B minor. And suddenly we're like on a different journey now, and it feels really natural to result to G major, okay? But we still have the memory of C in our minds. And so it's still, even though it felt really natural to resolve to G major, um, it still would actually feel pretty right to go back to C because we still remember that that's where we came from. So, um, so what I might do to, in order to get back to C is I'll go 
to F, which doesn't belong to G. And then maybe to the three, maybe to the seven, why not? And then back to C. Doesn't that feel very natural? So this is the kind of, these are the kind of harmonic journeys that um, Bach and all these composers take all the time. These journeys through the landscape and they allow you to tell a story. And this is ultimately what this is about for me. It's about storytelling. Um, if in your story, the protagonist of your story is maybe some motive, some melody, some fragment of melody, then it's really useful to have a convincing map, a convincing world to for, for your protagonist to move around in. And that's what this is. This is a, a, a world that makes sense. So, um, I'm going to add our secondary dominants back in because the secondary dominants are kind of deep too. Let's say that we're just looking at, um, at F, okay? Uh, the chord F. Not only do I have the secondary dominants that lead to F, But I also have, and when I say secondary dominance, I really mean secondary chords, right? Because they don't have to be dominants. Like this is this plagal cadence here is just is, is not is another one. Great secondary chord that leads to F. But in addition to these, I have a whole world of secondary dominance that lead to those. Okay, so each one of the secondary dominants of F can be preceded by its own secondary dominant. So if I'm using the plagal B flat minor six, I might precede that with its own play goal, which is E flat minor six. And I can actually use another layer of secondary dominance leading to that. So that I might precede that E flat minor six with this play goal cadence, A flat minor six. And I could even precede that with another layer. Okay, so um, this system becomes just totally infinite very quickly in terms of the options that are available. Um, and by the way, if you think this is crazy, it's really not at all. Um, the, 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 these nested layers of secondary dominance are used all the time. Um, let's say that we're in B flat major um, and we're playing rhythm changes, which is uh, the chord structure to Gershwin's I Got Rhythm. Um, the bridge to rhythm changes goes D7, um, G7, C7, F7. And actually that's best explained, I think pretty much the only way to explain it, it by, by, uh, by thinking of a chain of secondary dominance. And sp specifically, um, the chord that leads to B flat is F7. And what we're doing is we're preceding F7 with its own secondary dominant, which is C7, which we're preceding with its own secondary dominant, G7, which we're preceding with its own secondary dominant, D7. So the, the bridge to rhythm changes is D7, then G7, then C7, then F7, and finally back home to B flat. And there you go. Uh, you could pretty much explain any jazz standard within this system. It's all just paths taken through the harmonic landscape. Um, I wanna say one thing about voice leading. Um, if you spend any time with harmony, you'll quickly notice that these functional ideas I'm talking about here are completely worthless unless you have good voice leading. So for example, I would say that, you know, the, 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 the chord paths that I've been taking for you right now sound pretty good, right? Even I, I, I might go, might do that. I think that all sounds pretty convincing. Okay, maybe I'll bring back the diatonic chords, go around here. I think that all sounds pretty decent. And the reason for that is that I spent an inordinate number of hours <laughs> getting my voice leading decent here. Um, let me just show you what it sounds like without 
voice lighting. Okay, so now I turn the voice lighting off and I'm just gonna take some random pads here. Already that sounds terrible. That doesn't really make sense. And then if I go to, to uh, a diatonic chord, Okay, to me that that all sounds pretty terrible, um, and in fact, I find it very unconvincing. Like those chords feel very unrelated. So this is just an important point. Um, in order to make good harmonic movement, not only do you need function that makes sense, so moving within this landscape where things are hierarchically related, um, but you also need good voice leading. Um, otherwise, it, <laughs> none of it makes any sense. Okay, so I'm gonna turn voice lighting back on and I just wanna show you one final thing, which is kind of the whole thing that got, the whole idea that got um, me started on this rabbit hole is I really wanted to, to make this look like a landscape, a landscape that looked like the one I had in my mind. And, and in particular, that made it feel like if you're, you know, again, as I, as I was mentioning earlier, if you're telling a story in music, um, which is very much what I'm doing in my upcoming album, uh, Inventions, Reinventions. So if you're telling a story in music, uh, you want your protagonist to be able to move around a world that makes sense. And so that's what I wanted to convey here by actually creating a landscape. To me, this is all landscape. And I came up with a few different visualizations. Like I love this one um, because this looks like maybe like an Aztec temple or something like that. Um, that's if I remove the secondary dominance, it looks even more kind of um, very, it looks very constructed, you know, like this looks very man-made somehow. Definitely something temple-like about it. But um, look at this. So this is using... Um, instead of square shapes, rounder shapes. And um, this looks a lot more organic to me. It looks uh, more like mountains. So, um, you know, I think this is just, just an interesting thing to observe, which is that things look natural or man-made just depending on these little details of, you know, whether we make them square or round, for example. Here's another visualization, just subtle differences. Um, one thing I wanna point out here is that there's a well in the center here, right? For our home key. I'm gonna, let's go back to C major. There's a well. So the idea here is if you're hanging out anywhere in this territory, gravity itself, which, you know, describe as the gravity of, of tonal harmony, tonal gravity, just pulls you inexorably down to the home key. And you can go up a little bit, you know, to these secondary dominants, uh, sorry, to these um, diatonic chords, but they're, they're still close to the home key, to, to, the, to the tonic of the key. Um, but then if we go, if we modulate, which is what happens if we go over here, we're really in a different place. This is a separate place from the home key, but crucially, we're in a different place, but we can see the home key from here. And it, it's, it's attraction, the fact that it's lower, the fact that it's this deep well is, um, is very visible from over there. And that's kind of like the, the whole point that I wanna close on here, which is that in tonal harmony, the whole map makes sense and you can see everything from everywhere else. Okay, so um, that's it. That's my deep, deep rabbit hole. <laughs> and um, I hope to see you again soon, probably at the piano. Um, if you've made it this far, thanks for, thanks for listening.